I plan to look at many great thinkers over the course of this Learning from Legends series, lined up at Albert Einstein, Nikolai Tesla, Galileo Fibonacci and many others. All these people had huge impacts on their chosen fields and the direction of mankind in general. What's interesting about da Vinci though is that a lot of his research and many of his inventions had no impact on the scientific community or technological progress. But far from making him less impressive, that's in many ways what makes him so fascinating. Leonardo da Vinci was a man possessed of an indomitable curiosity that would lead him to make pioneering discoveries in countless fields, from biology to engineering to architecture to astronomy and many more. And much of this he did for no other reason than to sate that thirst for knowledge. His discoveries would go unpublished and his genius would go unrecognised for hundreds of years after his death. He was the prototypical renaissance man and in some ways the inventor of steampunk, creating technologies that seemed as though they should never have existed in his time. Rewinding a little, Leonardo was born, Leonardo de Ser Piero da Vinci, on 15th of April 1452, in the Tuscan town of Vinci. His name literally means Leonardo of Vinci. As is now legend, Leonardo was the illegitimate son of the wealthy Messer Piero Fruosino di Antonio da Vinci, as usual apologies for butchering all these names and words, and a peasant girl, Caterina di Mio Lippi, meaning that he would stand to inherit none of the family estate, and nor would he be able to continue his father's business. Da Vinci is largely thought to have been homosexual, was considered attractive, and was in great physical shape. Some suggest that the Vitruvian man is actually a self-portrait. He was outgoing, confident and well-liked, which helped him to overcome what would have been social disadvantages at that time. There is some debate as to whether Leonardo da Vinci was left-handed or ambidextrous. In fact though, a recent study by researchers from Uffizi Gallery in Florence suggests that he was really ambidextrous. In all likelihood, Leonardo would have taught himself to use his right hand over his dominant left hand, and that would have led to him becoming ambidextrous. Other famous minds such as Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, Nikolai Tesla and others are also thought to have been ambidextrous. It's possible that this may even help to thicken the corpus callosum, the bridge of neural fibres crossing the longitudinal fissure between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. This could improve whole brain thinking, potentially. During his childhood he reportedly spent a lot of time exploring the countryside where he was inspired by nature, the flight of birds in particular and the movement of water. This time spent observing nature is something else that many great thinkers seem to have had in common, and the power of nature to inspire is well documented. Unable to join any of the prestigious guilds owing to the nature of his birth, Leonardo was instead apprenticed to the artist known as Verrocchio. His workshop was considered one of the finest in Florence and was renowned for working in a variety of mediums. It was also responsible for many engineering sketches of bridges and the like for clients such as the powerful Medici family. By the age of 20, Leonardo qualified as a master in the Guild of St. Luke, a guild of artists and medical doctors. His father later set him up with his own workshop, but he continued to work closely with Verrocchio, while also working on his own commissions, such as the never completed The Adoration of the Magi. Around 1478, a couple of years after Leonardo closely evaded charges of sodomy, Florence and Naples almost went to war, and the men from da Vinci's guild were tasked with designing weapons and defences to help defend the city, a job that da Vinci took a clear liking to. By this time, Leonardo had already begun keeping extremely detailed notes of his ideas, inventions and observations. His ideas included designs for machinery, such as water wheels and hoists, and studies in maths, nature and biology. Over 15,000 pages of da Vinci's notes have survived, collected into works called codices. Among his writings, da Vinci wrote numerous to-do lists. These weren't filled with the household chores like taking out trash, however, but rather included lists of experts whose brains he could pick. Get the master of arithmetic to show you how to square a triangle, for example, as well as random questions, observations, and areas for further investigation. Particularly well known is his note to self reading, describe the tongue of the woodpecker. These notes are also well known for having been written backwards. Some say that this was a form of code, but in all likelihood it was simply a result of da Vinci's preference for writing with his left hand. Due to the design of quills at the time, it would likely have been easier for him to write that way. Years later, Leonardo would move to Milan. To secure work in the region, da Vinci first made contact with the Duke of Milan, Ludovici Sforza, describing himself as a weapons engineer and musician, only mentioning in passing that he could also paint. 
To try and curry favour, he showed several weapons designs to Forza, including his now famous tank or armoured vehicle. This was a weapons platform that would be powered by the passengers themselves, allowing them to carry and operate far greater artillery, and that would be covered in sloped armour so as to deflect enemy weaponry. The design, while never actually created, allegedly would have worked save for one distinctive error, cogs inserted backward. It has since been suggested that Leonardo actually incorporated this error on purpose to protect his invention during a time before patents. Other weapons designed by da Vinci included a 33 barreled quasi-machine gun that reduced the amount of time required for firearms to be reloaded, and a scuba diving suit that could be used to take out enemy ships from beneath. These designs show not only da Vinci's engineering skills and fervent imagination, but also his understanding of tactics and warfare. These devices solved common problems and created new strategic possibilities. Unfortunately for da Vinci, Sforza was far more interested in his artistic talents than his weapons designs, commissioning him first to paint a portrait of his wife, called a Lady with an Ermine, and then to sculpt a 24-foot tall bronze horse, which in reality would likely have been impossible for him to complete on his own without a studio, but he winged it anyways, and after showing a prototype of the horse, da Vinci was accepted into the royal court. Da Vinci would also work as a theatre producer for Sforza, wowing audiences with his technological special effects. No doubt this experience would further inform many of his later inventions. Sforza decided to go to war prior to the completion of the horse, which fortunately got him off the hook. The metal resources were better used elsewhere at this point. During this time, Leonardo was commissioned to paint The Last Supper, which took him three years to complete, but demonstrates many of his studies in mathematics, physics, human behaviour, and the properties of light. Of course, it's gone on to become a seminal work of art. Leonardo would spend a further 17 years in Sforza's royal court. Da Vinci also kept himself busy working on his own personal projects. Among the most notable was his work on cadavers, which he kept quiet in order to avoid another scandal or upset with the Catholic Church. His detailed sketches of the human body are today considered revolutionary and include a comprehensive and accurate depiction of the heart, with correct understanding of the operation of its valves, ventricles and atriums. He was also the first to observe the S-shaped curvature of the spine. Curators at the Royal Collection Trust say that had the works been published, they would have formed the most influential works on the human body ever produced. That said, his understanding of the circulatory system was not perfect and was limited by the knowledge and technology of his time. He believed, for instance, that the muscles would consume the blood they received. Nevertheless, many believe that these sketches are among his most impressive works, marrying his curiosity, scientific understanding, and beautiful illustrations. Another of da Vinci's most famous works during this time was the robot knight commissioned by Sforza himself. Just as impressive was the self-propelled cart, which was effectively programmable, using incredibly detailed mechanisms to enable preset routes. Another of da Vinci's creations from this time is the viola organista, an organ that emulated a string instrument, like a modern synthesizer. When the Sforza family lost its power and the French invaded, da Vinci would return to Florence in 1500, at the ripe age of 50. Here he would go on to develop a rivalry with young upstart painter Michelangelo. During this time he also took another stab at military design, working for the ruthless Césaire Borgia. He became the chief general engineer, supervising the construction of towers, as well as creating bird's eye view maps of cities, which were, as with much of da Vinci's work, well ahead of their time. It turned out though that Bourgeois was a little too ruthless for da Vinci who was at heart a pacifist, and so he built a high-tech suit of armour and began the process of confiscating all of his misappropriated weaponry. Sorry, wrong guy. Da Vinci fled Borger's employ in the dead of night before returning to Florence. Here, living on the money he earned from his work for Borger, he would paint the Mona Lisa as a personal passion project. He also spent much of his time building wings, as you do. As is extremely well documented, flight was da Vinci's absolute passion and he spent untold amounts of time designing incredible flying machines and studying the flight of birds. Some of his earliest notes include designs for planes and helicopters. One of these early attempts was the aerial screw, which effectively wound itself into the air like a helicopter. While this design likely wouldn't have worked, it demonstrated a keen understanding of lift. While he never built a working flying machine, his closest design was the ornithopter, which was a human-powered flying machine that utilised huge wings. Human-powered ornithopters have eventually been constructed, demonstrating that the idea was at least sound in theory. So he was close. Da Vinci lived out his final years in France, invited as he was by King Francis I, and given the use of his manor house, Clos Luc. 
Leonardo suffered a stroke at the age of 65 that robbed him of the use of one arm, and he died in 1519, leaving behind the Mona Lisa and his many workbooks. Looking back at da Vinci's legacy, what's most striking is the sheer breadth of his studies. We haven't even discussed the ways in which his art was actually informed by mathematics, how he would utilise golden ratios in the Fibonacci sequence to make his imagery more aesthetically pleasing, or how he would play with perspective and lighting, drawing from his own studies and experience as a theatre producer. The Vitruvian Man is perhaps the perfect example of this marriage of art, maths and science, being not only a highly accurate depiction of the human form, but also a kind of thought experiment, showing how that form could hypothetically be used to solve an impossible maths problem, squaring a circle. In case you hadn't noticed, the Vitruvian Man is also what inspired my own logo. Da Vinci also designed dams and submarines, experimented with geometry, and made many fascinating observations in the fields of astronomy, geography, and more. He theorised on the nature of tectonic plates, and suggested that the dark spots on the moon couldn't have been vapour, as they wouldn't remain static if that were the case. He researched biology, botany, architecture, and countless other fields. All of this was self-directed, driven by pure passion for knowledge. Rarely was he motivated by money or fame. And this multidisciplinary nature was not a limitation, but in fact one of his greatest strengths. His ability to draw on disparate fields like art, science and maths gave him a unique perspective that others lacked. Never did he let his lack of qualifications or formal training stand in his way. And this is what we can all learn from Da Vinci. To follow our interests and to never assume that we can't contribute valuable ideas and works. Individuals can still make a difference. Even if it doesn't lead to a big career change, that doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue what fascinates you or conduct your own experiments. There are few feelings more exciting than coming up with a truly unique idea or invention, or discovering something exciting for the first time. And with the tools available to us today, tools for learning and creating, our individual potential is limitless. Imagine if da Vinci had access to the internet or a 3D printer. What da Vinci did have was relentless optimism and self-belief, being convinced that someday he would be able to conquer gravity and master flight. What could be more inspiring than that? Imagine if da Vinci eventually had built his own working ornithopter and had taken to the skies on the power of his imagination alone. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting guys. If you did then please leave a like, please comment down below and let me know what you think. Has da Vinci inspired you in any way? What things are you researching or experimenting on or building right now? I've got lots more like this on the way of course. The next video is going to be the part two of the Nightwing training however. I'm also going to be starting a new polymath series inspired by da Vinci where I'm going to be looking into all kinds of different topics that we can teach ourselves. That's going to include things like programming, which lots of people have asked for, hacking, neuroscience, anatomy, and maybe in the future things like electronics engineering or even calculus. These are all things that I'm learning and that I'd like to share with you guys too. If that sounds something that you're interested in, then let me know down below. As always, thanks a ton for watching guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.